you are here because you're interested in automated decision making and our report. And I'll keep rambling for 30 more seconds for people to finally decide to come in. Ah, closing the door is always a good idea. It makes people realize that there's something happening that they don't want to miss. Ah, okay. Seems to be working. Um, we need to use the microphones because the session is recorded. It's a little, um, I don't know, preposterous to stand here with the microphone in a seminar room. Um, but anyway, and uh, also I was told that uh, if you have questions afterwards, and we'll allow lots of time for questions, I see that there are some people who were at the, <laughs> at the Commission, uh, at the uh, European Parliament event this morning, and we didn't have any time for questions because everyone went over. But anyway, we'll have ample time for questions afterwards. The problem is that um, to record them well, you would also have to come here we don't have a, um, a wireless mic, uh, or otherwise we just try to re repeat the questions, okay? So just as a um, note on um, housekeeping. Um, my name is Matthias Spielkamp. I'm the executive director of uh, Algorithm Watch and the editor of the report Automating Society, taking stock of automated decision-making in the European Union. This is Brigitte Alfter. She'll say a couple of words about herself in a second. I would also like to point out that Ralf Müller-Eiselt is here. He's, uh, hands up, uh, he's with uh, Bertelsmann Stiftung. Um, we collaborated with them um, on this report. Uh, so the, it says that, I have to look it up, a report by Algorithm Watch in cooperation with Bertelsmann, Bertelsmann Stiftung, supported by the Open Society Foundations. And Becky is also here, who is our support at Open Society Foundations. So um, we'll uh, um, present some um, results in a minute. And who's also here is uh, Christina, our executive advisor at Algorithm Watch, and also the author of the European chapter that's in the report and partly the German chapter. And Mark, um, who's uh, doing all our outreach work and much more than that, and uh, he's probably taking some pictures then here this afternoon uh, to put them on Twitter. And now I hand over to Brigitte, quickly. I mean, just for introductions. Yeah. To well, my name is Brigitte Alfter, as you already kindly introduced. I've been coordinating the team of journalists and academics who did the research. And so I will tell a little bit about the work process afterwards, because we think that the work process was important to make this a genuinely European report. So it's not just one researcher diving deeply into the entire European overview. It was actually a European team. But over to Matthias to some of the results first. Yes, um, I, I present some of the results uh, to those of you who were at the EP this morning. This is going to be a little boring because I didn't do another presentation for this event here. Um, so what about Algorithm Watch? What is it? We are an NGO. We've been, um, we started as an initiative three years ago, then turned into a real organization in the sense that, you know, we uh, became um, um, incorporated under German law. And since um, October of 2017, we also have funding, meaning that a year ago, basically, we started building our organization in the sense that we were able to hire people and so on and so forth. So it seems a long time, but uh, the time that we've had to actually make an impact is uh, not so long, and this is also why um, I'm really pleased, and we at Algorithm Watch are really pleased that we were able to put together this project here because we always said that we are an internationally minded NGO based in Berlin, um, but we don't want to focus our work on uh, Germany alone. We never had that intention, and this was the first time we really had this opportunity to take this uh, outside of Germany. So. Um, we are a non-profit organization and we say that we have, our aim is to evaluate um, and shed light on algorithmic decision-making processes or automate decision-making processes that have a relevance to society, not just any automation process because there are millions and millions. Meaning in that case that they are either used either to, to predict or prescribe human action or to assist um, or um, uh, make decisions automatically. And uh, it, it'll be interesting if, if you're interested in that discussion because we put a lot of uh, thought into that also when we designed the report um, to talk about this definition because it's contested. I mean, any 
let, let's say any de um, definition of uh, automated decision making is contested right now and uh, it's, it's always interesting to discuss this with uh, experts in the field. Um, what does it mean that we watch? I mean, these are the four fields that we defined in our mission statement. We watch, we explain, we network, and we engage. Watching is uh, uh, partly what we did in the report. We find examples of where um, automated decision-making is employed, uh, but also what kinds of discussions are surrounding it. They can be discussions by government committees or commissions, but there can also, of course, be discussions by NGOs and others. And we explain, trying to um, shed some light on what is it actually that we are talking about and where and how do these examples work. Uh, together with our colleagues from the Open Knowledge Foundation and Walter is here. If you have any questions about that, raise your hand, Walter. Walter is one of our collaborators uh, from the Open Knowledge Foundation for a project that we did last year. It was called Open Schufa, where we um, investigated the credit scoring algorithm behind the most uh, powerful um, credit scoring company in Germany, which is called Schufa. That's why the project is called Open Schufa. So we all also try to do things like reverse engineering, but only in very specific cases because that's usually a ton of work and uh, you need um, many resources dedicated to something like that and you need systems that you can actually reverse engineer and come up with ideas how to do that. So we explain, we network, meaning that um, we try to build structures of uh, other organizations and individuals who would like to work with us on that and this is one of the outcomes of uh, this report um, and we'll talk about this a little later and engaging in our case means that we also try to engage in policy making directly by making recommendations and uh, trying to work with um, Political decision makers can also be companies, the private sector and other NGOs to find a way to make uh, all of this work for the common good for all of us and not just for, um, for example, the companies or um, the governments. I mean, the governments is always a difficult term because um, they usually, I mean, in most of the countries we're talking about democratically elected, but anyway. Um, the money, that's always a question, especially when you are in a civil society space. Where does the money come from? Um, how do we stay independent? We get uh, funding from Bertelsmann Foundation. We get funding from Hans Böckler Stiftung, which is a um, foundation that is close to the labor unions in Germany. For them, we do a um, research project focused on automation in human resources management. We get money from the Open Society Foundations for the report that we just produced. And we last year had a substantial amount of uh, funding by that we um, collected by a crowdfunding campaign for Open Schufa, uh, which was um, almost 44,000 euros. So that gives us, I'd say, you know, um, a, a variety of uh, funding sources, which means usually that um, uh, on the independence uh, side of the of the issue, uh, that's that's a pretty good thing. So why this report? Why did we do that? Um, we are saying, or we are claiming, arguing that automated decision making is at the core of debates about discrimination, equality, and participation, right? Um, it's always a matter of framing this issue, and I'm a journalist myself by profession, and I have lots of discussions, for example, with other journalists, and there's always the question of how to frame this. Um, we have this term of um, algorithmic accountability reporting that was coined by an American who many of you probably know, Nicholas Diakopoulos, who wrote an interesting paper on that a couple of years ago. I like that framing very much, but it sort of works for journalists. You know, you can, um, you can um, find journalists who then um, understand that this is a, sp a specific kind of reporting and you need some specific expertise for that, but the readers are usually not interested in algorithmic accountability reporting. They are interested in, is someone discriminated against? Is someone treated unfairly? Or uh, is equality harmed by a system that is being used? So um, you have different modes of, of, of looking at this from the inside and from the outside. So this is what we're concerned with, discrimination, equality, participation. Um, and the examples that we usually use to discuss this are mainly from the United States. I suppose, or let's, let's test this. Who has heard about the COMPASS algorithm? Okay, I'm surprised that not all hands are up because the COMPASS algorithm is the 
thing that is used for risk assessment of criminals in the United States. And uh, my impression is that it has come up in every discussion about <laughs> automated decision making that I have attended for the last two and a half years. Um, and it's, it's good because, I mean, it's, it's great that ex example exists because it opened up a whole new uh, level of debate about these systems. But we argued that um, Compass and Chinese citizen scoring cannot be the only examples that we should be discussing as citizens of the European Union because this stuff happens at home and we would like to point out that it does and what actually is happening. So this is why we set out to, uh, um, to do this report because the situation is different in the European Union, of course. It's very different from the United States. It's even more different from China, but we have examples of automated decision making and, um, and it's not that they don't exist. So, um, the European Union is very diverse, so uh, when you do something like this, you have to have uh, very good knowledge of the language of the country that you're looking at, the culture and the structures there, because otherwise you won't find the examples that, that you're looking for. If you do this uh, as an outsider, if you, for example, only speak English, and try to research something in Poland or in Slovenia or in Spain or in France, you will run into uh, a lot of difficulties because there, it, it usually there is the impression that uh, there is a lot of things out there, but you, you will only find the ones that are reported on in, in English and not in the country's language. So that's why we said um, that we'll find people who have a good knowledge of the topic of research, of um, automation, automated decision making, but they also have to be from uh, the different countries that we, are, that we want to look at. And this means that the report basically has two different goals, or had two different goals. One is to give a, an overview of the state of automated decision making in the European Union, but at the same time, um, be the nexus of creating this network of researchers who look into this issue and um, um, who, um, well, um, interact um, on this and, and also inspire each other. So we ended up with 15 researchers from 12 different countries. Um, it was quite hard to find all them, and this is something that we'll talk about a little later with Brigitte, because I, we expected that this is also interesting for a, a forum like this one here to find out a little more about the nitty-gritty practice of doing something like this. So we found these uh, different researchers in the different countries and um, they are from very different professions. They are um, from academia, many of them are university researchers, but there are also journalists among them, they are civil society members. And we from the outset said that's fine, that's great, uh, it's not um, a disadvantage. On the contrary, we think it, should, it can work to our advantage that we have people from all these different places and also um, with different expertise. We have people with, um, with a media studies background from journalism, law, cultural studies, international relations, sociology, philo philosophy, data journalism and political studies in, in that team, right? So it was a very diverse team um, in, in um, looking at it from um, a qualification uh, point of view and also professionally. Now, coming to the results. Um, we have four categories in the report itself. I mean, it's pretty clear I didn't say that, but it's on the internet, right? <laughs> You can look it up. Um, we have two versions. We have a PDF version, but we also have an HTML version, meaning that uh, if you go to that uh, algorithmwatch.org slash automating minus society URL, you'll find an, uh, an HTML version that you can easily read on smartphones and tablets as well, but you can, of course, also download uh, the PDF. And for that, we have... Um, sorted this whole thing into four categories, and these four categories are how is society discussing automated decision making. We said that this is really important. We wanted to give an impression of in these 12 countries and on the European, I mean the EU level, um, what discussions are going on. So um, we collected examples like the high-level expert group on artificial intelligence on the European level, but also government commissions in the, uh, on the country level, and whether there's, for example, specific NGOs um, involved in that, in that discussion and what they are doing. 
then what regulatory proposals exist, um, including, of course, a discussion of automated decision-making and the GDPR, but also, again, on the country level, is there something that uh, people are trying to do, uh, people, I mean, governments, legislators are trying to do, um, and here it needs to be said that uh, regulation, what regulatory proposals exist, does not only entail laws, right? Because regulation is a much wider area. It can be codes of conduct, it can be te technical standardization, and we tried to find examples of that. Of course, I mean, you can imagine if you're doing this in 12 countries and on the EU level, you can't expect this to be exhaustive. Um, I'm certain that we have less um, cases in all of these chapters than exist, right? But at least we were very successful in pointing out that there is something going on in all of these categories in all of the countries, right? Um, so this does make uh, a point from our perspective. What oversight institutions and mechanisms are in place? We separated that from regulation because oversight is something different and uh, I think this is one of the um, of the more interesting um, results of the report that there are very different approaches to oversight. We had this uh, interesting example in Finland where there was um, a credit scoring um, decision being made and someone contested it and it went to the ombudsman for discrimination in Finland and he um, after a lot of deliberation gave it to a tribunal which is different from a court it's important it's not a court but it's a um, it's it's something like uh, you know uh, in a, on, a, on a level underneath the court because you can contest their decisions and the tribunal then in the end decided that the um, credit scoring model that the company used was discriminatory and threatened to um, 100,000 euro fine if they continued using it, right? So this is quite a statement by an oversight body and in Germany we have this, this example of uh, the Schufa who um, now what's January, um, six months after the GDPR came into effect uh, are still sending out um, information about the data th uh, that they collected on um, on the uh, on the people in their database that is not compliant with the GDPR, and the oversight institution um, waves their finger and says, "Please don't do that and change it." Right? So different approaches there, and uh, of course, and this may be. Uh, the most interesting part to many people, what uh, automated decision-making systems are already in use in these different countries. And there we made sure that we collected examples not just from the private sector but also from the public sector. So, these examples, what came out of it? First of all, priorities differ widely in, uh, from country to country, which is to be expected. I still think it's good to find this evidence and to, to write it down because you can then start comparing things. Um, and let's, for example, look at research funding. We all know these um, numbers from the different countries, you know, Germany pledging to invest 3 billion euros in uh, artificial intelligence. And, you know, again, we're not talking about artificial intelligence, we're talking about automated decision making, but it's sometimes hard to distinguish. Um, but in Spain, for example, um, with a um, GDP of more than 1,400 billion US dollars, they have a program that is worth 4 million euros. It's called the uh, Activa Industri Industria 4.0 program. And they support 400 companies to advance their digital transformation and improve their competitiveness by adopting new enabling technologies, right? 4 million euros Ooh, for 400 companies. Wow. Um, in Sweden, on the other hand, there is one private foundation that gave 100 million euros to two universities, um, the Wallenberg Foundation, I mean people from the Nordic countries and especially from Sweden, they of course know who they are. Um, they um, have a lot of money, the, which shows uh, the, by being able to pledge 100 million euros to develop machine learning, AI and the mathematical apparatus behind them. So uh, there's quite a difference there. Um, we have political debates, and in the political debates, for example, in Germany and the UK, um, there are, in addition to a number of government and parliamentary commissions, also the data protection authorities who are weighing in, the business associ associations, and uh, many NGOs who already look into the consequences of automated decision making. I mean, um, Algorithm Watch is focused on that, but of course there are other NGOs who also look at that. The Open Knowledge Foundation, Privacy International, Article 19, and uh, so many more, right? Um, so we also listed those who are looking into this. And then on the other hand, our 
researchers, our colleagues uh, from countries like Poland, Slovenia, or even Italy, they said, well, um, automated decision-making uh, making systems are used there, but there's basically no politi political discussion about that. And by the way, Natalia is here, um, who um, also uh, worked on the Polish chapter, so if we have some specific questions about Poland later on, uh, we have an expert here to answer those as well. Now, legislation and oversight. In France, a law mandates all branches of government to make their algorithms transparent, but no one complies, right? Um, that was one of the uh, most interesting things that uh, I learned from the report. Um, and there are examples for this, examples in the sense that we know about algorithms in France, and, there, and if you try to find examples of um, any kind of information that is out there about them, you won't find anything. And uh, in Finland, I, I already gave you that example, it's that uh, there was a very um, strict um, handling of a specific case with uh, the discrimination in, uh, the alleged discrimination in credit scoring. So there's a wide range of approaches. And now I put all of these on one slide because I think it's, it's interesting to see um, what is already happening in the public sector and that is also something that I expect many people to be interested in. Um, there are automated systems in use in these countries that are helping to identify children vulnerable to neglect in Denmark. Um, uh, Brigitte, I, didn't, I don't think you said that, but Brigitte is not only the research network coordinator, but she also wrote the chapter on, on Denmark, uh, so she knows a lot about that example. Then uh, we have um, allocating treatment, I mean systems to allocate treatment for patients in the public health system in Italy, detecting welfare fraud in the, in the Netherlands, uh, the Siri system, we reported on that uh, independently, probably some of you have seen that story and uh, there is a legal challenge to it and a parliamentary inquiry, not a parliamentary inquiry, that's not true, uh, it's the Green Party asking for more information through a parliamentary um, uh, um, means or tool um, from the justice, system, uh, justice ministry there. Then uh, allocating benefits to the unemployed in Poland, detecting learning problems in primary and secondary schools to help teachers find problematic pupils in Slovenia, assigning social benefits in Sweden and then predictive policing basically all over the European Union. So lots of stuff is, is going on there and um, I think uh, we should take notice. So we distilled a couple of recommendations out of that and I'm not going to list all of them because that um, would take too long, um, but I have a um, selection. First of all, we recommend to focus the discussion on the politically relevant aspects. Um, and those are not singularity or super intelligence or whether next year all the robots will take o uh, over the world and enslave us, um, but what I referred to before. Then consider automated decision-making systems as a whole, not just the technology, because uh, in many quarters this is discussed on a very t uh, with a very technological focus, whereas we say uh, and we argue, no, um, this whole ADM discussion starts with the decision whether to use an automation system for a specific purpose and the reasons for that. For example, austerity, you know, um, we had uh, Prabhat Agarwal who uh, heads the portfolio of artificial intelligence and others at the European Commission this morning and he, for example, uh, argued that uh, we have the situation that uh, especially the public sector are strained uh, or is strained for money in many countries and we have to acknowledge that. Um, and I agree, we do, you know, we can't be unrealistic or not see that, uh, but from a political point of view, of course, we can't just take this as a given, you know, if uh, we say that we see a problem with automated decision making and the reason why we're using it because there's not enough money in the public sector, um, then I'd rather argue that the, maybe we should try to find more money for the public sector, right? Instead of saying, ah, okay, the ADM system is not working, so let's find a technological solution for that. Um, empower citizens and public administration to adapt to new challenges. We do think in liberal societies that people have a responsibility as individuals, so um, if technologic technology changes, we all have a responsibility to, uh, to also deal with that, to smarten up and to find ways to um, to use that and uh, not behave like children who need to be protected. Um, but of course that only goes so far. And the public sector is in a uh, similar situation. 
um, there are a lot, of, a lot of demands from the public sector to change, to use advanced technologies, but in many cases there's no expertise and there's not much help to get this expertise. So, um, you know, pointing fingers is usually not, uh, um, not enough there. Make sure adequate oversight bodies exist and are up to the task. I already gave examples of that, what I mean by that. And involve a wide range of stakeholders in the development of criteria for good design processes and audits, including civil liberty organizations. Um, I think I don't really need to argue for this point here in this room, but um, on, the, on, on many levels, on uh, member states' levels and on the European level, um, there is a lot to be desired on that point because uh, civil society involvement, especially li uh, civil liberties organizations, are usually um, the last organizations that are chosen for any government committees, um, even if they say that they would take part. I mean, some um, of these organizations say they don't uh, for, for um, ideological reasons. They want to stay outside to be able to have their to, um, watchdog function. But even if they are willing to do so, uh, they are often not invited. And mandate the public sector to provide transparency about the use of automated decision-making systems, where, how, what for they are used, and then also the procurement uh, aspect of it. Who are they bought from? Who developed them? Did they do that in-house, or at least did they, did they do that partly in-house, or did they just buy it from Accenture or IBM? And if they did, you know, how much do they know themselves about how this stuff works? Okay, so that's it. Um, that was fast, I suppose, but um, also, um, as I promised, you know, we wanted to have lots of time for discussion afterwards, um, and. Um, if there are any questions right away, please raise your hand. Otherwise, or not otherwise, but uh, also I would ask uh, Brigitte to weigh in on the on the networking uh, aspect of it. So, is there anyone who? Okay, we have a. Um, do you want to come to the front to take the mic? Because otherwise, we can't hear you on the recording. Yes, thank you very much for your excellent work in this field. There is two questions I have, indeed, and one is, are you tackling the question of machine learning, especially in the concept of algorithmic accountability that I believe does expose specific problems? Have you, what have you done with this regard? And the other question is, um, if you, um, if you look at decision making, would you also consider recommendation systems? decision making. So um, all these nudges that we now face, is this already a decision? It's not like a government deciding you go this way, you go this way. Um, it's really just these nudges. Are these already decisions under your definitions? Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's to be expected from you. <laughs> Very hard questions. Um, I'll start with the last one first. Um, we say, we. Um, I, I use that expression we also include decision support systems. So that can be recommendation systems. It always depends on the case and how they work. I have to try to remember that, and probably Natalia, I think it was from the Polish uh, example, where we have a figure um, from one of the ministries. Christina, you're nodding, can you remember it exactly? It, there's 1% of people who did not decide with that specific system. I can't remember now exactly what it was. Do you? Oh, it was the one that I used. Okay, so assigning benefits to, to the unemployed. So the system makes a recommendation, and, and uh, in 99% in of the cases, this recommendation is then put into practice, right? Now, um, we can't make this question, is that a decision to, into a statistical question, and saying, oh, it's 99%, so it's not a decision, because it may be that they looked at it and said, yeah, they're all fine, you know, and they use their autonomy and their, uh, you know, um, uh, rational um, or rational arguments to find out about that. But of course, um, we need to look at it very closely to find out, can we still um, talk about decision? And I mean, I know we know each other personally, so I know you're a lawyer, and uh, because of that, um, you're aware of many of these aspects that uh, weigh in on that. For example, compliance. You know, if the structure of your company or your um, public sector organization is that is in is is set up in a way that you need to justify 
um, every time you decide differently than the system recommends, you know, that puts another level of uh, pressure on you um, and will most certainly lead to the fact that you are not going to contest the system's recommendation. So you, you already hear that. I can't even give an easy answer to that, but um, that's the answer that I can give. Again, we have to look at the individual cases. And when it comes to machine learning, um, are we looking at that? Yes, we are looking at that in an abstract fashion in the sense that we're saying um, many times the fact that there is machine learning employed is used as, a, as an argument for saying this system is a black box and we can't really know what is going on. And we say this is not the case. First of all, um, all of these um, systems, even if it is machine learning, are based on uh, programmed decisions um, that are coded into these systems. Um, of course, it can lead to unintended effects, or it, they may be intended, but they can't be explained easily. Um, there is technology that is being developed and is not really um, available right now to control for uh, what is happening there. But my our Algorithm Watch's main argument here is that in many cases, it doesn't really matter so much how this result came about. It matters whether the result is okay or not. And okay is a very broad uh, term here. It can, it can be okay in the sense, is it accurate? Is it fair? Is it dis discriminating? Is it uh, harming uh, equality or something else? And if that is the case, then uh, our position always is, we don't really care you know, how the system came to that decision or recommendation, but if the result is not okay, you'll have to do something about it. And you can't hide behind the fact that it's machine learning and uh, it's, it's probably non-deterministic in a sense. Okay. Please. No, 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 it's okay. I mean, I, I think we have time enough. Uh, this session is one and a half hours, right? I'm, I'm correct. It, uh, so, so we have until six o'clock, so um, we have plenty of time for discussion. Hi, I'm uh, Jonas here from the University of Brussels. Um, I'm wondering, so you've been talking about the black box of the machine learning, the algorithm, the coding that's behind these um, processes. Um, have you come across initiatives or projects or research um, that has been trying or that is trying to involve users or citizens really directly into unboxing um, this black box um, by integrating the citizen in, 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 in coding and making it maybe fair, making it transparent, accountable from the beginning. Um, and if you have not come across um, anything in this regard, do you think it's possible and maybe you have an idea how um, that could be possible? So, um, a person who's in Brussels but not here is my co-founder, Lorenz. Uh, he's, a, he's not a programmer, but he's been in software development for a long time. And when we discuss this, uh, we are a little at odds about this because um, there is this idea that you need co-development, you know, with different stakeholders, different people, um, involve them early on in the process. And I think... It's possible and it should be done. We haven't thought it through entirely yet because it's complex. But what uh, people who do this are uh, freaking out about is you can't have users decide on the way you code. You know, it's just not possible. That's not how you can um, that you can actually program any kind of complex code. You know, it's more than a couple of lines of <laughs> basic or whatever. Um, and uh, the so. Um, to answer your first question, we have not come across a precise project like that in our research. Um, we know, of course, about a couple of initiatives, um, not just in Germany, but in many other countries, like, uh, I mean, the, OCA, uh, the Open Knowledge Foundation is involved in that as well, um, doing uh, hackathons and uh, trying to um, convene people to discuss these ideas and to come up with better ideas of how to do this. Um, and we've talked to a lot of companies already who are interested in applying um, a process of 
some of them call it ethical um, development of, um, of code, uh, others call it by a different name, um, to apply that in their own company and to also invite outsiders to give them some uh, advice or feedback. Uh, so this is happening already, but um, there is no, um, in that sense, a, a precise or concrete project that I could name where there, for example, is a company that asks uh, users to be involved in, in uh, development of uh, these systems. Hello, congratulations for this impressive report. It's really, really um, impressive. Uh, I'm, I'm Gabriela Zanfir Fortuna, a policy counsel for the Future of Privacy Forum, a think tank based in Washington, D.C. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one is very brief. Have you encountered um, any of the projects that solely automated um, without any human involvement? Uh, any of the examples that you used? That's the first one. And then the second one, um, who is writing the algorithms? Um, uh, have you looked into the service providers? Because I presume that uh, the government or you know the, the social security agency doesn't have uh, like a department that writes um, the algorithms. Uh, have you looked a bit into that? Uh, who are the service providers? Are they European? Are they based elsewhere? Um, what type of and then yeah, related, you know, how are those contracts, um, uh, those relationships um, over in uh, oversight? What's the oversight over um, mm -hmm. those? Thank you. Okay, again, I'll take the last question first. That's a tremendously interesting um, aspect of it, and I'm, as a journalist, are specifically interested in that. But no, the answer for this report is unfortunately no, we did not, because we didn't have resources for that. Because finding out this kind of stuff is usually a lot of work, especially in uh, most of the European countries who have a completely different uh, history and standard of uh, freedom of information in the United States, not the Nordic countries. In the Nordic countries, you um, probably have encountered uh, um, less obstacles for that, uh, and we should look into that because, as I said, procurement, this whole issue of uh, who uh, produces what for whom, um, where does the public sector buy these solutions is uh, at the heart of all of this. And there are other initiatives that are looking at that, um, uh, journalist initiatives, for example, to, f to identify that and find out. But unfortunately for the report, we didn't have uh, the means to, to do that. Um, we have this one very interesting example that I mentioned in the introduction, or we mentioned in the introduction, it's about that company in Finland that looks at individuals' emails. And for example, what they are doing is they an they are analyzing it not with um, the software, I mean, they are a private company anyway, they are not a public sector, but even they don't do it with their own software, but they use IBM Watson for it, right? So uh, they don't even really know what's going on because they just use a third-party system to do the analysis that uh, basically they then offer to their clients. Um, so that, that, that is a, at least um, a related example. And then the, the first question, um, and now I have to again dig in my uh, memory, the um, municipality of Trelleborg in Sweden, they say that they have fully automated some um, decisions for allocating uh, social benefits. And there is a discussion about this in Sweden because, of course, uh, um, in Sweden the GDPR applies as well. So there is this debate that you're probably all familiar with. Um, when is a decision really automated and, um, and how do you deal with that? And uh, the word is still out on that. But they said, you know, that's what our Swedish colleagues told us and what they researched. They said that here um, some decisions are fully automated and they are not uh, looked at by any uh, person anymore, right? But that's the only example that I can remember off the top of my head, Christina. Hmm? Ah, the traffic control. Yeah, I mean, that, that is, uh, that w there we have this, this question of uh, is that automated decision making in the sense that we are, I mean, in the, in the um, closer sense or in the narrower sense that we're discussing in France, there is a system of uh, automated um, uh, speeding ticket management. So you automatically get a speeding ticket from a radar and, um, and no human being ever looks at this and decides is that appropriate or not, you know.
Okay, so we had one question here, so, so that you know that I saw all of you. We had one question here in the first row, then we had one in the last row, and then we have one over here on the left-hand side. Uh, thank you. Um, I have a, a question about uh, the, one of the recommendations uh, that you give is uh, to empower the individual. And in particular, the way that you said it, we're in a liberal society, so people shouldn't be, be like children. And I'm a bit skeptic in general about this argument. Um, my own research is into the right of access to personal data, which is very explicitly proposed as a, as a measure to give empowerment to, to citizens. Uh, but the reality of the use of the right of access is that in most of the cases you don't get any answer of a company or, uh, or organization or you get a very shady or very limited answer. Uh, so, I don't know, I, I still think there has to be a lot more discussion about it, but often these measures then might actually disempower people even more than they already are uh, to start with. Um, uh, then on the other hand, you also made the remark about maybe we should have discussions about if automated decision-making systems should be used at all in certain, so I just want to have your reflection on that. Like how can empowerment be contextualized in such a set way that it actually empowers people instead of just being a particular thing that really fits our liberal image of how smart and individualized people should be, but reality often is very different. Yeah, thank you very much for that comment. I um, This is also something that we discuss frequently because we are not of this faction who says, yeah, um, you know, you just need to understand what is going on and then everything is fine and you can make your uh, free, free choice because that is not true. We all know that. We know that is true when it comes to uh, privacy and data protection and we also know that is true when it comes to automated systems. It's of course especially true when, it's, when it comes to the public sector because there you don't even have a choice. Still, at the same time, we would like to uphold this idea that people need to understand how technology works to make a conscious decision and uh, to also make the decision in some cases to say we don't want a system like that, you know, or in some other cases, yeah, we are fine with that, um, uh, you know, it, 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 uh, because we are not um, arguing that automated decision making should be banned in general. We are saying that we need to d establish and work out some measures to control it and to make it work for the good uh, of, um, you know, m most people and not just the few. So um, there's always this balance to strike and, and um, um, this is not very specific, this answer, but again, the problem with that is I think you can only apply it to concrete cases. So, uh, for example, a company could argue that they really make transparent that uh, how their uh, system works and people have a choice. So, if they do not use that choice, if they just uh, say, we'd like to use that system but we don't care about how it works, you know, then you also have to assign some responsibility to the people who just used to to, uh, to, to use it um, and not think about it too much. But of course we are all aware of 27 pages of uh, um, um, privacy um, um, you know, documents that uh, we are given. So it can't be a solution to say um, it's up to the people to choose it because then of course they would be powerless. Um, we don't know what the right balance is and I don't think there's a correct balance in general, um, but again, we need to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, it's, it's a, it sounds a little frustrating, but uh, it's the only answer I have for that. Yeah. Hi, I'm Marcus. Uh, thank you very much. Just uh, two questions. I got in a little late, so possibly I have missed something. Uh, but in the end, you said that um, AI is most times uh, non-deterministic, which confuses me a little. Because if you consider deep neural networks, usually you just end the learning process and then you deliver to the customer. And it's just a simple mathematical function and will not change. And if you have, for example, a random forest, yeah, it is random by design, but if you have a decision tree or a set of decision trees, you can really display to the customer why the decision was made through the tree. So um, I, I don't see this, uh, if, if somebody sa says as excuse, it's non-deterministic, well, uh, I, d I don't see a reason for this excuse. 
uh, really, because most of the time I think it is. The uh, second point is, um, well, I, uh, Bettina Baron K. Leuven uh, once said uh, that uh, parents have to look after their children. Uh, she, she meant with it that um, if um, a neural network or an AI in general uh, gets discriminating, it's uh, due to what it has learned. And uh, you talked about this, oh, it's okay or not. So in the AI sector, most times I hear it's okay if the neural network um, just displays the ground truth. Yeah, so if the ground truth is discriminating, for most AI people, it's okay. So where will, will, will you see the, uh, the, the difference? What, what should be changed according to what you think? Okay, thanks for giving me that opportunity to correct myself. I hope, I mean, I, I thought I said there are very few cases where you can argue that you can't um, explain why a system is coming to a certain um, conclusion. You know, as you said, because most of them are deterministic. There are very few examples where you can start arguing, yeah, but here, it's just, you know, in reality, I think, especially you seem to be very knowledgeable on that. I, I suppose you would agree with me that it's a tremendous effort for many of these complex um, systems to find out why they came to a specific conclusion, right? So it's a resource problem, um, but in general, I agree with you. I say, no, I, I, I was misunderstood if, uh, if, it, um, if you understood that I said uh, it's non-deterministic in general and therefore we can't know. No, it's the other way around. Um, and uh, the, the other remark is, I'm, you know, we are fed up with that if uh, people say, yeah, you know, um, that's, life and we just uh, use our um, machine learning systems to look at these data and then that's it. We know by now from very interesting experiments, uh, Joanna Bryson and others uh, pointed that out, that uh, of course, you know, you have very um, biased uh, or you have bias in data sets that's, that's clear by now to almost everyone. It's still very hard to correct for those. It's still very hard to correct for those. This, that cannot be used to just leave the bias in the data set and then in the machine learning system. So you are right. You have to uh, guard your, your children. Um, and um, the, the, uh, that's what I hinted to when I said um, the outcome is what counts. We can't accept as an... No, uh, I wouldn't call it an excuse right away. You can't accept it as, a ex as an explanation that, okay, so uh, there was bias in the data set and there's bias in machine learning and then the system is biased and that's all okay. No, it's of course not okay. And if you can't find a way to change that, then you can't use the system or you are punished for this. I mean, if you are, if someone finds out and there are mechanisms for that, there are oversight mechanisms and all of that. So this is much of this is, is, is missing. And I'd like to give one example that many probably also here in the room know, which I find interesting, is um, uh, Amazon um, started developing that system for recruiting. And um, it was a long effort. I think wh when it's true what I read, um, they started developing this in 2015. And last year they ditched it because they found out that it discriminates against women, you know. Um, but it was Amazon themselves who said we were unable to correct for that and because we were unable to correct for that we stopped using the system. It was not some journalistic investigation that uncovered it and then because of public pressure they stopped that. You know, there might be a spin in there because, you know, they leaked this information to Reuters and of course you have to um, um, think uh, what was the purpose or what was the strategy behind that because they could have just kept it to themselves. So probably they wanted that, um, that um, attention. Uh, but uh, it hasn't been contested so far that it was them who developed it, who were not able to correct for this problem and who then said, uh, we are not continue using this. Um, and what I find very interesting about this, first of all, there was a self-correction because they said this is not the outcome that we want. Um, but on the other hand, you know, Amazon is a data company, you know, with a retail arm and they don't seem to be able to solve that. 
you know, that they have, because the reason that they gave was they, that they have a highly biased data set that they trained the system on. Um, yeah, because all of the people who, um, who made a career at Amazon were male. I mean, of course, not all of them, but many of them. So what the system learned is uh, to, to um, give a preference to men in the recruiting uh, process. Um, but they said, you know, it's a bad, bad idea to do that. But if they can't find a way to do it differently, you know, it seems to be quite a tough problem. Okay. So thank you very much. I find it very very interesting. I've been um, I've been researching on auto, um, automated decision making in European Union member states in the last months, but from the legislative point of view. So how GDPR implementation laws implemented Article 22, and just nine member states did it, and they do not totally overlap with yours. Uh, but they are not obliged because Article 22 already do a lo does a lot of things. So two questions. One was related to what you were referring briefly about France, because actually. Yeah, it's true that even before the GDPR in 2016, they had this code of relationship between public and uh, administration, and they said that actually, apart from trade secrets, they should release codes. So uh, you, you say that uh, they actually don't do that. Uh, why? They use the trade secret um, argument or probably it's just something because uh, public administration has a list of codes but probably uh, other entities are not doing that and the other point building on Rene uh, remark was uh, are you also considering to or have you already seen how safeguards are respected for example right to contestation in some kind or how this how we can make useful contestation so I don't know if some companies or some examples had this uh, accountability not only on explanation but also on contestation for example thank you unfortunately the answer to the second question is very short no we haven't, and it's a very interesting aspect, and uh, I'd be curious to hear more about that, and I would be happy if someone did a study on that, you know, how this is uh, not just implemented in law, but also how is it used in practice, because that's very important. Um, do people make use of their rights, and if they do so, what happens? Um, the France example, and you know, I can't, I, I don't speak French, and I didn't research that myself, so uh, what is um, what was told to me by my colleague Nicola, who, uh, wrote the France uh, chapter, is that there's basically no public pressure in France. The um, public sector is obliged to uh, publish that, to give out information about that, and they don't, and no one holds them accountable. I mean, the press doesn't, and uh, individual people don't, and uh, if they don't, I mean, the courts will not become active. If there's no challenge, then nothing happens. So basically, um, th there seems to be a situation, from what I understand, is that we have a uh, quite a good legislation, um, but it's meaningless because no one is making use of it. No one, I mean, you still need to f fight for your rights, and apparently no one in France does on that account, you know. There are some other people fighting for their rights all the time, but um, not when it comes to automated decision-making, apparently. Okay, we have no questions for now, so please, Brigitte. Yeah, I'll tell a a few words about the way we did this report because Matthias and I knew each other for a while and when we talked about taking his work to a European level, uh, I chipped in with my background. Let me tell a little bit about that. I come from investigative journalism. I had some years as a Brussels correspondent for a Danish newspaper and suddenly I realized if I worked the way I was educated to, in a very competitive way, I would only give my readers a fraction of European reality. If I didn't cooperate with colleagues from other countries, I wouldn't get the information I wanted because I couldn't get the European data set, so we had to piece it together. And I couldn't, I, I wouldn't, obviously, I don't speak Polish or Italian or whatever, so I, and I definitely don't have the, the necessary sources to work in these countries. <coughs> so I got used to collaborating with colleagues and I've been one of those who've done that systematically. I wrote a book about it, I started teaching about it. So when Matthias wanted a, a European report, he brought me in for the networking competences. And so we tried to compose a team uh, with quite a few journalists and quite a few academics 
each of them being really competent, really committed to these topics in his or her country. And then I coordinated the team, which is, it's really gritty, as you said. We met once physically and discussed, not least, the terminology, the definitions, so what is automatic decision-making. And this discussion, of course, uh, is meaningful in terms of trying to carve out what is it, but it's also meaningful in getting to know each other and see each other's background and get to trust each other, which is important in teamwork. After that, we had a weekly telephone call and a weekly sum up, which we called newsletter, because both journalists and academic researchers have a tradition of diving deeply, digging deeply into a certain field and bringing reports and doing interviews and compiling a lot of information and then deadline approaches. And then you start writing and you don't talk to anyone. Um, so it is often a very lonely process. What we need to do in a team like that in order to get the best of it is to share as we go. And as a journalist, I would, the way I was educated, I would really cross-check and fact-check before I publish. But when I share with colleagues, I don't publish. I tell them, whoa, I'm researching, I'm working on this particular case, and indication is that. And then I share that, and the others may be inspired. Or we had a, a colleague from the UK, and in order to trace automatic decisions used in the public sector, he said, wow, I found this way of trying to trace them by going through the list of public tenders which is transparent. Um, and so I could learn, oh, well, I look into the public tenders, and then I found out in my countries they're not quite as transparent as in the UK. But there are methodology uh, inspirations that we can use from each other. There are uh, the, 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 some of the Nordic colleagues uh, who were academic researchers had intense interviews with public authorities from which others could learn on how public authorities think behind the scenes. Um, so that even when I didn't have the time to do actual research in depth with a public authority over months as the Swedish researchers had, because I'm a journalist and they are academics and had been working on this already, um, I can still learn from the way of thinking that was behind the scenes. So the process of working together and inspi inspiring each other is helpful. And also, I didn't experience this in this team, but in other teams, we can help each other to shed light on uh, whatever, call it bias, call it, uh, you know, traditional thinking that we each come from. So in, in cross-border collaborative journalism, my favorite example is from, from the German-Greek team. Uh, who in the, on the height of the Euro crisis, where most of you will know that in Greece the Germans were depicted uh, in a certain way and in Germany the Greeks were depicted in a certain way. So having these two in one team, they could really try to find wording that was, would be accepted in both countries. They could fact check each other so that they could get rid of prejudices. And this is really what is happening in such teams. Here in this team, we were all so focused and so specialized, so we had a shared language. I didn't really experience any of the, the bias uh, cleanups that I have experienced in other teams. But uh, I did experience excellent inspiration, both on the methodology and on raising my awareness of what could be done with algorithms, which wasn't necessarily at the top of the attention in Denmark, which I wrote the report about, um, but which could be something that I should look into, and then I did like, look into, and maybe I could confirm it, and maybe I could say, okay, this is not a thing in, in Denmark. But it was, the process was, was inspiring. And it's, in a way, the, the additional investment, if we compare to doing a report, one researcher, you pay this researcher, and she or he sits in the office for some month and does the research. The additional investment here uh, was that we paid a trip to Berlin, we had dinner together and one night in the hotel and one full day in the office where we were really tired afterwards. Um, and then we had weekly telephone call 
which functions along the the lines of uh, coordinating uh, teams of, of coders. It's called Agile Project Management, which we try to learn from. As journalists, we don't come from that background, but we read what others do. And that means we have a short meeting, everybody says what he or she has stumbled over, come across, found most interesting. Uh, and before that meeting, I try to to uh, report with each of them and then make a newsletter, as we called it, so that if you miss the meeting, no big deal, you'll be informed on it anyway. And you can read up what was said, and you can go, ah, there was this other meeting, and then we follow up on that. Um, and then it was edited centrally, of course, which is also typical in collaboration. Uh, but I think we, we surmounted well the, the national differences and also the professional, because journalists work in one way, academics work usually much slower, uh, and journalists think, oh, how, how, it, it must be fantastic to have so much time, and the academics say, you must be mad to publish three articles a week. Um, so, so how do we meet? And these kind of differences are, of course, something you have to surmount in a team like that by building trust and communicating a lot. So that was the background of how this got a European report, more than just describing, but in the, in the process. And we have a couple of minutes. I have, um, I, I've never been to a privacy camp before, and um, I thought this, at least the setting, would be a little more community oriented, not, <laughs> not this way. Um, because I have questions for you, or we have questions for you, uh, we would, of course, be very happy to hear if any one of you is doing any kind of research that is related to what we have been doing. Um, I mean, I, I already heard that some made remarks, but I'd like to hear more about this in detail. Um, so if there's anyone here who would like to comment on that now in the forum, I'd be very happy about that. But otherwise, if not, then we can meet afterwards and you uh, let us know about that. But I think this is also, um, the, this. Or I, I, I'd appreciate it if we could get a better idea of who is working on what in um, connection with this topic of automated decision making or uh, uh, artificial intelligence, whatever you want to call it. So I already saw two hands up and um, th did you want to comment on that? Okay, but you did, uh, so you'll probably give us a little more detail and I'd, as I said, I'd be happy if uh, someone else would uh, also let us know what they're doing if it is related. Well, we, we are trying to get uh, into this algorithmic transparency which is quite very, very difficult. Uh, we have uh, sometimes uh, nice audios from the FU Berlin, who are really uh, good at those things. For, for example, they had a neural network for picture classification, or a big picture database, and they just uh, uh, let one FisherNet and one other deep neural ne network run and uh, figure out with almost the same precision in the end and the same uh, F1 classifier in the end, so it were almost the same quality. And uh, uh, l later on, when they try to figure out uh, why uh, the neural, uh, the, the fisher net um, uh, decided that the picture was from a horse, that's an example which is uh, now, uh, I, I don't know if you have it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah uh, uh, it's just because there was a label on the pictures from the horse because it was from an uh, archive of horses and the fisher net just says, uh, identifies this label and the deep neural network just says, identified, hey, this is the shape of a horse, it's the back tail of a horse and, and so on. And uh, we had some uh, other examples where, uh, for example, it was very difficult to find out its only picture classification, yeah, whether it's a ship or an island. For example, because most parts are blue and uh, some are water and so on. And uh, so, so in picture classification, I think we are uh, already a, uh, one or two steps ahead. Um, in, in the case of this uh, random forest, it's quite difficult because if you have uh, really huge decision trees, you can um, see all the parameters and where the, um, uh, where the uh, tree splits. And really, to get a logical view out of it, is, is uh, you can do it for every case, but that is that is really difficult. And uh, 
Just well, let me ask you, because you said we, but you didn't really say who is we in that. Who who are you, I mean, as a person, but also who is the team that you're working with? Uh, well, I'm working for a company who is uh, providing, let's say, uh, IT security and GDPR services mm -hmm. for the customers, uh, mostly finance business, automotive business, and others. And we are, um, let's say, in a loose relation with the uh, University of uh, Hanover with L3S. And uh, which is uh, led by a professor who is very into privacy. I, on my own research, uh, privacy from 2012 to 2016 mm -hmm. at the L3S, and I still get all those things. Uh, in, in Germany, we are, um, or, or the guys from the L3S and the guys from uh, uh, the law departments are st uh, starting rails. So if you just look at ii minus laws.org. We have Robotics and AI Law Society, which uh, will meet in uh, Berlin uh, in a few months, and uh, they will just, it's, it's for guys related to law. So yeah. you have to um, be able to keep awake uh, listening to lawyers for one day if you want to attend it. Um, but there are those um, professors from the AI department there too, and uh, they want to just uh, move it to a European level too and just want to find, because uh, there are other universities in uh, Austria and uh, Switzerland and so uh, already participating. And I think it's a very good approach to start with ethics, start with law, and then uh, consider w what is really feasible, mm -hmm. what, what, ca what can be done right now, and uh, what are the parts in algorithmic transparency we can have in two years or four years for industry. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Rails is in the report as well. So uh, if you want to look it up, uh, you'll find the link there in the in the report. Um, and it's an interesting example of, um, as it was just said, um, a specific um, you know um, a branch. Um, in this case, uh, legal professionals who are saying that we need to also look at this more closely and organize or create a, it, an, an own organization for that. Okay, anyone else? Great. Um, thank you very much. It is late and there's still stuff coming up. The party or Shoshana Zuboff at the CPDP opening night and <laughs> whatever you prefer. Um, and thanks a lot for being here for um, for your questions. And um, as I said, if uh, you have more to discuss like uh, on a bilateral basis, we'll stick around for a couple of minutes. Um, tweet about the report, share it, um, tell your friends and colleagues about it, and also, if you don't like something in the report, uh, send us an email, you know? It's a, it's a, we want to learn from this as well. Thanks a lot. Good night. <laughs>